Are we good to start or should we allow others to join in as well? Uh, we can wait for two more minutes. A couple of minutes? Yes. Yeah. Let, let them settle down and then we can share. Yes. So good evening, everybody, people wishing on the chat and people just joining in. Welcome to Soil Institute of Management. And uh, it will be an interesting session for those who are specifically looking at HR related, you know, understanding and generally also because anything to do with business and analysis is highly relevant for all management graduates. So we have a few participants, I guess, and uh, it's five, seven. I think, are we good to go? Yes, ma'am. Like rest I think we should start and the yeah, people yeah. who join. The rest all can join, keep joining. Yeah, because yeah. we should be fair to the people who have joined in on time, right? Yeah. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> so in all fairness to those people who have joined on time, welcome once again. And uh, what we'll talk about today is data-driven HR, right? So as we normally understand, HR is something which is viewed as a people-centric, you know, the, the emotional, the softer aspect of management. Why do we visualize that? Visualize that because, you know, typically management has broadly uh, the components which we normally say men, material, money. Everything else is a function of this in business. When you say men, material, and money, material can be purchased with money. Money, either you have it or you source it. Men, you hire, you, you what you call, you develop or you possess some within and some from outside. But the men component of management is the only thing that acts on its own. Men need not be moved whereas money and material need to be moved. So when you're talking about the men component, then the soft aspect comes in because the emotions are possibly the only consistent truth across evolution so far, be it management practices, be it mankind, be it any kind of evolution. Man has been laughing for you know, happy occasions and expressing sadness through crying or any other expression. So emotion and expressions have generally remained consistent. And that's the aspect which actually triggers how we behave and how we react. A function of all performances is your behavior or rather, 
the manifestation of all my performances is noticed through my behavior only. So if you perform well, then what is noticed? Your work is noticed, which means what? We are not saying that you calculate well or you sell well or you meet the targets. We're just saying you're focused, you are driven, you are result oriented, your actions speak more than words. So what are we seeing? We're seeing the behavior aspect. Material doesn't just demonstrate behavior. Even if it does, we are going to measure it, calibrate it, and so on and so forth. Calibrating men and human behavior is highly difficult, if not impossible. So, and you cannot do business without man because even if you want to create an artificial intelligence tool, which will be artificial, the creator is natural, a human being. So there are going to be human beings in the business context. And when you want to make a strategy, how effectively and efficiently to use your men for the sake of your business growth, then you will have to understand what strategies does my business need? How do I place my people to meet my strategies? How do I now keep my people doing the things that, that I repeatedly want them to do? so that they enable meeting my strategy. I'm just making it look like it's the simplest thing to do, but I'm sure all of us understand it is very, very complicated for people to do what others want them to do repeatedly. You might have many incentives for people to be doing what you want them to do. If an organization has a strategy to say, expand into new business locations. You need people who are willing to go to that location to do a market survey or to do a preliminary product launch. Then you need to have willing people who want to go there. If there are no people with willingness, then you have to induce willingness. If you have to induce willingness, then you will have to find out material. It might be money, it might be something else. So when you're doing all this, why are you doing all this? You think you're doing the softer cushioning of the people, but you're doing all this primarily to make sure that people are willing to go to a location where you want your business to happen. Then you will have to now start understanding how many people are available who can go to that location. And within the people that are willing and available, are those the right kind of people that I would like them to go or are the people that I actually want to go not willing to go? If the people that I want to go are not willing to go, how do I make them go? What in the past has worked with these people? Have they been typically people who are self-driven or are they people who are driven by monetary incentives? Or are they people who are driven by professional growth? What do we have as past tense data for these kind of people? So that I can induce them possibly with the same kind of tools once again. What have we done? We have tried to note in our own whatever methods, what makes an employee do what he or she does? It might be the nature of the work. It might be the nature of the person. It might be the money associated with the work. It might be the team that feels good for work. It might be the manager who's very supportive and very you know nice to work with. It might be the company's policies as such, which are very friendly that people think it's a great place to work. There could be so many parameters that you will know and you will tick who does get induced by what. How will you know who gets influenced by what? Very commonly, we will say do a survey. 
even if you're not doing a survey, a very good manager need not do a survey every time. Even if he or she is managing a team of 50, you notice people who are coming in late. You notice people who are leaving early. You notice people who are staying aloof. You notice people who are working beyond work hours. You notice people who come forward to say, oh, this task is happening like this. I think we should do it that way. They come forward to give ideas. You notice them. When it is 50 or maybe till 100, depends on your capability to remember names, faces, actions, and who did what a week ago or 10 weeks ago without getting influenced by recency effects and recency errors. Are you critically observing people's actions and activities? Then in a way you are storing some data in your head about your team members. And when somebody does well, then there is a reaction to it. Either you appreciate or you go ahead and tell the other team members that let's clap hands for this person today. <clears throat> so there are some actions that follow what you observe. Making a plan work, especially in business context, involves a lot of detailed planning. There are many ifs and buts. So when you sit down and make a very detailed plan, what will you do? As somebody here is saying, you look at past records. Yes, very right. You look at past records to see what went right, what did not go right. Or have we revised our goal post this time? So if we have revised our goal post this time, which which uh, you know, data of the previous time will work. So the past is an indicator, not necessarily an input to direct input, I mean, to the present and future. Therefore, what people have started doing is, we have started recording every incident as critically as possible in an unbiased manner as possible. What does that mean? So I'm doing this webinar with you all today. This is a recorded webinar, right? So the questions are recorded. My responses are recorded. Maybe at the end of it, if we have to run a poll, then your responses and your reactions will also be recorded. What does it tell? So next time we do a webinar, then we start collating these kind of information to say evening five o'clock, is it a good time? Weekday, is it a good time? The topic, was it relevant? The instructor, was he or she doing justice to the topic and the context of the audience? So you collate incidents around these parameters and next time when you want to conduct a webinar, then you will go back and say, okay, Thursday evening, five o'clock works for what kind of people? Friday evening, five o'clock works for what kind of people? So when you want to do one instant, you can remember, you can write notes or you can just make an Excel sheet. When it is a consecutive event and when it is going to repeat in larger volumes of people, then you are going to have a method of collecting this data automatically without human intervention every time. So what does Zoom do? They have created some way of capturing attendance data. A simple, simple example I'm saying. Similarly, if you go to office, what do they do? They capture face recognition. By method of face recognition, they capture who has entered office. Then by method of face recognition, they will check who is in which location of the office. You don't want to be monitoring, but you just even want to know for good reasons that God forbid some mishap happens, then you know who is where. So these kind of tools to collect data have gradually developed because the need has remained uh, the bottom line has remained the same, but the, the various needs have changed because of various methods in which businesses have begun to be done. When we were all 
So, you know, in one place and doing business, we all knew who was coming to office at what time, what they would eat, what they would, you know, wear, everything was known. Then when we started scattering businesses, then we said, okay, our office is there in other locations, but we don't know the people who work there. Then we started writing letters. Then from there, you know, technology evolved. You started to have, I'm just fast forwarding. You started to have emails. Then you wanted to have a common method with which people worked across five or six locations in a country. Then you had common policies, wherever you work, this is how it will be. And you started measuring the data and you, if you had to consolidate, you would have to carry the data physically or you would have to email the data to one place. It used to have a lot of errors. Then you would have to sit and clean. You would read cell by cell and then you would clean up and put it together. From there, today we have started coming to an age where we are doing IoT, we are doing things where which are semi or fully automated, that you don't have to enter data, but data is already populated. Without even knowing who has recorded my entry anywhere, if I have certain tools on my phone, I'm always being noticed. So if I have an office app downloaded on my phone, my movement around my office area or wherever I go is always noticed. Right from monitoring the login hours on your laptop, which some people do, though we all know it might not be encouraged always, but it might be necessary also at some point. There are the rights and the wrongs of why it is done. <clears throat> From there till how much is being effectively contributed to a company, everything is getting noticed. We all wanted to be noticed. Why? We want a fair treatment for each one of us. So the one who raise, runs the hardest race needs to be noticed. And the ones who need to run harder need to be noticed. And the ones who need help, they also need to be noticed. So this is the reason why, you know, unlike sales and finance, the HR also needed to have data, which was very largely invisible. Counter sales is very visible. You know, so many items moved across the counter. You know, cash coming in, you know, it is there. But how many people are absent? You will know it. That's easy. How many people have come but not working? Or how do you monitor the productivity of each person? And strategically, who are the people who are needing some kind of training and training whom will be more beneficial against training others? So there is qualitative, there is subjective information that needs to be managed. Is it necessary? Yes, it is necessary. Why is it necessary? Yes, efficiency can be tracked, yes. Why are people necessary for an organization? Why are we harping around HR? Why can't we let people just be there and assume that they will do because they're getting paid? Why can't we do that? If I take up an employment, I'm supposed to complete my undertaking with an organization to get particular people with skill sets, okay? Is that good enough? Is that good enough to get particular people with particular skill sets? <clears throat> Is skills the be all and end all of growth? Okay, it will promote growth in a company, very good. Is skills the be all and end all of growth of an individual and a company? Or is there something deeper than skill that we need? We all need not just skills, but we all need a lot of attitude. Willingness to work, yes. 
how do you get these kind of data? So you will have sometimes very visible direct data and sometimes data which is very latent and hidden, which you need to know deeper because every strategy needs to understand data, right? So if my company recruits certain kind of exclusive skills, I also need to know which are the kind of people that carry these exclusive skills. And this person has exclusive skills, but still is he a good fit or is she a good fit or not? So strategically people have become so crucial, especially in post pandemic times, that companies revolve purely around the talent they have. By design, HR is a strategic business partner rather than just a provider to operational success. It one time used to be provider of manpower for operational success, but today HR is essential for strategic success, right? What kind of people, when, what levels, what market rates, niche, which people who own what kind of patents and do they come at free, uh, you know, access? By free access, I mean, are they there as open market entities or should you go and access them through specific routes, you know? There might be some prohibitive uh, ways of getting hold of, say, scientists. You can't get them just as free access. So that's the reason why data is very essential for your success. And strategically, HR is connected to company strategy and data is connected to HR. Therefore, HR data is connected to company strategy. I hope I've made myself clear. I'll just run you by a few slides, which will help all of us see what we want to understand, right? So let me move into the power point presentation mode. Right. This is what we were just trying to get clarity on. Data is no more just gut feeling that I feel this. Your feel also comes out of a certain past experience. So that feel also can be quantified or, you know, your, your memory storage has certain cells from where you are retrieving why you experience something and converting that into gut feel. You touch something, it feels hot. So next time when you touch, you will also know it will be hot. And when you touch it repeatedly, then your body knows what to expect when it is hot. How is this? This is no more a feeling. This is now action with a certain anticipated reaction. So gut feeling was what it used to be that I can sense something intuitive. It is still there, but that again can get calculated by the number of attempts your gut feel gets right or wrong. Okay. In the 1900s, it used to be just operational HR as I was mentioning. And in the 2000s, it became strategic HR because the kind of people required for the nature of new age businesses was changing. And while there were people available, the right kind of people was becoming a difficult situation. So it became a strategy to know that, okay, for this kind of business success, these are the kinds of people that I should have with me. And this is how I will retain my people or attract my people. Now what it is, it is purely data-driven HR. So we have gig workforce, we have uh, what you call remote working, we have many types of employment, many types of people resources that have emerged. And at every point you want to know who, when, where, what, and how long. There's data, and then you know what is to be done with whom. Is data the end of all HR decisions? No. The data-driven approach characterizes HR analytics is in line with the development of the entire concept of HR from just being an operational discipline 
towards becoming or being a strategic one. Instead of saying hire 100 people, you will say if I hire 50 people, this is how I will manage and this is the amount of output they will give. If I have 60 people, this is how it is. If I have 100 people, this is what I get. Why? Because under these simulated conditions, this is what I had got earlier. So I'm going to repeat my simulation exercise next time to get real time output. How do you create sense out of what is generally touch and feel, or rather what is generally feel and more intangible? So you will have a logic. I start with the horizontal left side box logic. The right logic to my talent strategy. Right? If I'm going to be in the e-commerce business, what kind of talent strategy I want? I want people with digital skills. Then I will go into the right analytics. I will form the right kind of questions. Where are these people available? How many hours do I have to have them? Do I have to have only a few of them or do I need more of them? Just like in physical setup, you used to have people in shifts. Do you need digital skills people also in shifts? Do you need all of them at office? Now you have offices which run combinations, right? Three days, two days, first dispatch for three days, the next dispatch for two days, then some of them permanently remote. Some of them can have an option to come, you know, as and when required. So where is this information coming from? This is coming from the right questions and answers and the right kind of information storage. So information, design how to collect that information and statistically identify what is happening with the information that you have. Then the third is what we capture, is it sufficient or not? Is the data sufficient or not? Suppose I have data of absenteeism. Is it sufficient for a decision? I can also identify absenteeism. Does it have a pattern? then it might be sufficient for some decisions. Well, just absenteeism is a necessary condition. Pattern, then gender, right? Then department. The more classification you do, then the sufficiency level becomes more deeper and refined. And the last of it, the essentials is the process. So I have created certain databases. Is it sufficient? No, now I have to have a good knowledge management methods like, you know, is it stored in the right process? Is it accessible to the right people at all times? Does it have a way of not being intrusive? Do I have biases in my data? Is this data based on my culture and values? Or is this data just for the sake of collecting data? What do you mean by culture and values? So there is a lot of debate on collecting data on gender. Because the moment we say we are an inclusive and a diverse society, people say you should not collect gender-based data. But if you want to take decisions on our mothers to be given more leave, you might want to collect gender-based data. So it depends upon the context, depends upon the value based value system that you're following, depends upon what influence you want to carry into your decision. That's the right process and effective management of knowledge that your company has created. In the center of all of this is the metrics, which create a lot of value for change. <clears throat> I'll just take a pause here and ask people, what do you understand by metrics. Oh, I think I've, I will share my screen now. Right. Okay, this is what I was talking. There is logic, there is analytics, there is sufficiency, and there is process. I think my screen share was not working. 
I'm sorry about that. And now I have all of it in one place, right? So if all of this is happening, that is when I know I can have my matrix for change. What is a metric? Can I have some answers on the chat box? Or on the, yeah, on the chat box. What do you understand by the central oval here? HR metrics and analytics. What is HR metric? What's a metric? Metric is a measure, basically. A meter, right? One meter is 100 centimeters. That's a metric. So can you... Yes, of SS, quantitative assessments, right. So if you have, what can be an HR metric? What can be a metric for measuring people? Height, weight, you're not supposed to measure. What HR metrics can be used for analytics and bringing about change? Performance metrics, very good, very, very good, appreciate. So performance metric, now you will have to define that performance metric saying, say, simply say punctuality can be one of your performance measures, right? Result orientedness, target orientedness. Efficiency, you need to have a formula for, by which you want to measure my efficiency. Do you want to say how much input I have given versus how much I output I have generated? or you would just simply want to make it very simple for people to observe and write. It's like writing 800 words and you're only allowed four or five errors. Just something like that. Keep it very easy for measurement. Now those things will improve your efficiency and that is strategic change. I want to become a Six Sigma company, simple. Everybody's work quality, every email, everything is measured, every time, you know, turnaround time, that is measured. And you now get to the deviation of who is doing how much at what time, what quality. And that measurement tells us who needs how much more training and is the company actually headed towards where it wants to be. Right? So I think I've got you to understand what is LAMP framework? This is basically not just for HR analytics. I think all analytics will normally have LAMP as the basic framework. Logic, analytics, measurement, and what is the fourth one? Process. Let me go back to that slide. Right. This is the LAMP framework, which we call logic, analytics, measures, and process. And the center of it is why is this process being? Undertake. So we've been speaking about business goals. We've been speaking about, you know, locating the right metric and then now collecting and analyzing relevant data. Let's pause here. Collecting relevant data. Collecting relevant data could be from what I'm seeing in the chat box is resumes. If I, for example, take recruitment as one activity, collecting and analyzing relevant data. So I have applications. I'm collecting all applications of say commerce graduates. I'm analyzing all the commerce graduate students into certain categories, put them into frequencies of you know, 90 to 100, 80 to 90, 70 to 80 and so on, and analyze them into various kinds of groups of experienced, job experienced and non-job experienced. And you now know from a pie of, graduates, you know how much is commerce graduates, then from them you will know what are the scoring ranges in which there are people. And within the scoring ranges, I will know who are the people who have job experience or not job experience. Then now I will get insights into it that typically commerce graduates with this score range get these many jobs and potentially in this pay package range, you can draw some kind of an insight. Not necessary always right by just seeing the linearity and what you just observe, that is called descriptive. You just make your charts, it is called descriptive analysis or descriptive statistics. If you want to find correlations of two or three different things, then you will have to go into identifying the statistical tools. 
may be based on certain parameters, may be based not on any specific parameters. So you will have possibly something to do with parametric tools, parametric methods or non-parametric methods. So the complexity of the analysis keeps growing. I'll just give you an example. We did in the class one activity to say a large volume of data was there. And then we just tried to assume in different locations about people's absenteeism. And you know, we did a whole company chart and the absenteeism was like, you know, 30% across the company. Then we broke it across locations. On an average, again, it remained 30%. But at one location, it was 18%. It started getting, you know, very interesting. Why is this place having only 18% absence? We went to go and see that location and to understand, is the data too small? Is the number of people very small that everybody comes to office inevitably so that work doesn't suffer? Or is the location so interesting? At some point, what we found later on is that location had most of the people working from home and absenteeism to physical work was less. So this is how you can even obtain deeper level of insight. So if that kind of absenteeism data can be captured, then you might want to consider in introducing remote working for the benefit of many people being available and not just available, then we correlated that absenteeism with the productivity of those locations. And after the productivity, we also try to correlate with the number of errors. Is absenteeism directly or indirectly correlated with quality of work, right? And then you communicate across to people saying, okay, this is what we've observed. Therefore, policies like this should be made so that higher amount of efficiency, greater amount of people's satisfaction and overall good growth for the organization is being made, how you communicate so that the impact is felt across all levels. So I remember at one point, you know, when we were at one workplace, people used to come late to office. We went back and we did a survey. What is it that you would like to be enabled if you were to come early to office? Then there were various kind of answers, you know, stagger the work hours so that we don't have to always, all of us travel in the peak traffic time. And uh, some of us can be given work from home. Then we went and checked at the entry. Do people arrive late towards the office, uh, you know, even to reach the office or do they arrive late at the sea? What we observed is people reach the office building almost 10 minutes in advance the time it takes for the person to reach the gate and then to reach the seat and log in is 15 to 20 minutes. What was happening? Locating parking spots was taking more time than traveling to office building. There were a few designated parking spots, but the number of cars were far more higher than the designated number of parking spots. Then the company came up with two ideas, run a shuttle so that it will be beneficial, save fuel, save parking time, uh, employee friendly, environment friendly, or designate certain amount of parking spots almost at par with others, or borrow parking, you know, uh, in, Delhi Gurgaon borrow parking from the municipality for a certain space and designate certain prepaid coupons so that every day this need not be a hassle and designate your office valet driver there so that people can just leave the car safely and then move to their office space and in three months time 40 percent increase in on time attendance on the seat was noticed. And the remaining people, what was noticed? They were coming late, not because now of the parking problem, they were coming late 
mostly because there was a traffic you know congestion at a certain point closer to office so what we did is at that point people can you know uh, what would we say they then we started running a shuttle and then we said okay log in or people who are already in the shuttle if you can you know swipe your i card then we will consider you are there even if you are not yet there on the seat because your intention to be in the office on time is more important than not just being present so you are not just taking people for the face value of being present you are also noticing their intent to come on time so trideep now i think i have answered your question does insight help hr to arrive at a conclusion for a business decision thank you right so hr analytics is noticing people related dimensions collecting the right kind of information breaking the information into smaller units of tangible data that can be collected for the data associate the right kind of measurement and then work backwards to find the right kind of correlations and come across with business related decisions where do you collect data in hr you collect data in hr in all the functions of hr recruitment compensation training and development or learning performance management you know making sure that performance measurement performance on time performance kras somebody was writing kras and kpis performance uh, targets are all given then managing attrition sometimes you want people to live down sizing sometimes you want to introduce you know compulsive redundancy that you need some amount of redundancy in your organization and you want to manage absence as i was giving the example then what is core hr core hr is what kind of new policy should we bring about what culture change is happening should we change the way we think in this place making people happy today we are asking about happiness quotient that's core hr if your employees are happy obviously they are going to be more willing and your contribution is going to happen back there's also something called service value chain what you see in the front end at the shop counter when you go is all connected with the last policy decision which keeps your employee motivated and happy to do the job over and above every day again and over so service value chain at every service touch point codify what are the processes codify the process into what are the data points and then codify the data into what to be collected direct information or indirect information so i'm just going to you know this is pretty detailed a slide so you don't have to get exhausted looking at the volume on this slide yes priyam you are absolutely right i'm just saying when you do a measurement you have to take three things right what approach you want you want an efficiency approach you want a best practice approach or you want to just create dashboard for the monitoring sake or you want to just identify cause and effect what causes what antecedents and precedents that you can have and then you use the measures the right kind of measures in that approach and of course the purpose that you want to solve by the study so your analytics is basically working backward if i have to understand this purpose i have to know what i should measure to understand the purpose if i have to measure that then i have to understand what approach i should use pessimistic approach optimistic approach straight line approach constraint approach i can have many kinds of approaches right right don't get overawed by what is there it's simple the y axis is what we will read first hr data is primarily 
used for three things. Simple management of operational data to understand the functional capabilities. That is what is actually happening in the process. Are we good? Are we improving? Are the people learning? And then organizational focus. Are we towards the goal? Are we competing or right? Are we actually doing cost saving or are we hitting the top line? What is repetitive? What is not necessary? So you use from an organizational level, then at a functional level, then at an individual operational level. Those three kinds of data are captured and each of them has a reason. There can be a reactive measurement. There will be a standardized measurement. There is focused, there's strategic. Now don't get again, you know, too technical here. What is reactive measurement? How many people should be deducted salary for coming late? Reactive measurement. Where do you get that answer? Data management. The scope is not cost cutting. The scope is to introduce punctuality and the effort is manual and automated. Manual by you know, seeing the work, remotely, what awaited, automated by face recognition, by RFIDs, whatever you want to. What is the standard? Say, if you are late for more than three times in a month, there can be a leave deduction and therefore salary deduction. That is the reactive measure. What is the standardized three times in a month? What is the focus to reduce, what would, what would I say, uh, late coming? What is the strategy? All employees to be treated fairly and uniformly. So if you want to treat all employees fairly and uniformly, first start with basic discipline of coming into the office on time. You standardize that by saying all those people who come late for more than these many times and these many minutes will go through a cut. And the reaction is put the cut on the people and you manage it through a data of collecting it every day manually or automated or whatever methods you you can even go up to sophisticated because we have hybrid working. Got it? I think I'll stop this here because this is recruitment which we have seen earlier. So I will stop share here. So the fundamental answer that we are trying to give the companies that we work with is, Use data to manage the motivation of the people with positive reinforcements so that there is more willingness, efficiency, and customer centricism to collaborate towards meeting your organizational strategy. If the culture is pessimistic, you can use the same data to punish cause fear, use it more reactively than proactively, design policies for stringent measures, make your organization run through fear of punishment rather than run through motivation and encouragement. So the culture can be the same, is the different, you know, approaches, the data can be the same. So the same data can be visualized with different perceptions. That is why we say analytics is not the be all and end all of strategic decision making. The policies are not made just by what data says. Data will say something. It is about you and your cultural value that makes the insight the way it should be read for the management. And of course, then the decisions come based on your policy. A vice versa, the loop closes that based on the previous cycle of data, the new policies also get created. So data-driven HR introduces a lot of fairness, reduced ambiguity, timely decision-making, 
highly competitive engagement with people and thereby you know giving a sense of confidence in the employee saying that i am treated unbiased yes very high chances of success i am being treated unbiased though i know i am being noticed i am being monitored but i am not being treated with a bias if you can't monitor you you cannot do anything you know in terms of output so if you want to monitor then you got to measure the moment you measure then people will say oh i am being noticed but still you will have to give them the confidence that you are being noticed for the right reasons i think i am kind of done with the purpose that i wanted to talk this topic open to questions and i hope people have understood the purpose of data in hr conventionally it has been seen as one of the areas of management with very less influence of numbers with very less influence of tangibility but i think this is what is very very important for us to understand that hr data is very essential is very influential to understand how people need to be managed for companies success so that's about what i had to share and hope i am making it useful and all the best uh, are we doing any question answers people who are asking questions welcome to ask any questions that you might have does hr play a major role in competition between companies like work culture let me read yes there are benchmarking activities which people do annually you benchmark against the companies that you want to compete with then there are companies like gartner there's a company by name great places to work they do the same data analysis and tell companies where you stand vis-a-vis -vis others in your own league of business right appraisals are more objective than biased and subjective very true anything else that people have to say one out of the box question when will our college start when will hostel allotment happen out of the box not question out of the context question maybe uh, i don't know if you are a pgpm or a pgdm student if you are a pgdm student we will wait for the aict to allow us to tell the start date and we from our side looking at the scope of things we have assumed july to be the start of the classes and therefore hostel allotment should happen somewhere around june so that it facilitates people to move into the hostels but we should still wait for aict to give its calendar i hope you got the answer right yeah but still you know don't take my answer as the final answer please reach out to the registrar or the admissions team they'll keep you continuously updated okay yeah anything else that people have as questions or we can call it a day so uh the team at the back are we done or are we still on i think we can close ma'am like yeah. there are no more questions there are no more questions no. okay you been a part of it as an operation analyst in the operation analyst team okay now looking for a switch towards hr analytics what are the possibilities to make it happen go ahead and make it happen it will happen uh, besides that take hr do the fundamental courses well 
if you're good with basic uh, analytics tools, you know, the R, Python, SQLs, you can even go to the extent of creating HRIS tools for the company. From analytics, you can go towards product also. The chances are very good. That's the way forward and in fact, the way future for managing HR. There are wonderful companies that we get on our campus like Hono.ai, Tech Mahindra, all of which we use a lot of analytics in HR. So options are brilliant. Okay, so I hope that answers your question as well, Tridib. Yes. Will we get a participation certificate for attending this webinar? Oh, not too sure. I think master classes were certified. I'm not too sure if the webinars are certified. I think uh, the admissions team will be knowing if these are also certified. Thank you, all of you. Have a nice time and uh, stay focused and get all prepared and geared up for the courses, PGPM or PGDM, whichever way you are. And good luck. Good Thank luck you, to everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you.